This is Brent Richardson, and welcome to the Business Minutia Podcast, where our focus is on the details of business that are often passed over by traditional classes and leadership training. We focus on the stories of real people who have tried, failed, and learned through their experiences and are willing to share their lessons with others. working from home for several months now stuck at home with us all the time I kind of feel sorry for you what do you miss about going into the office well I don't miss the commute uh, but I but I do miss you know it's a little thing but I miss going to lunch with uh, with folks in the office I miss hanging out by the coffee maker and just small talk but I miss going to lunch and I miss some of the places that I'm used to going to lunch you know, I still do it, and some of those places are open doing business, but it's a, it's a good 45-minute drive just for lunch. Right, and everybody's coming from different directions. Yeah, absolutely. And these small businesses that are in that area are all being affected like this. It's quite challenging, and you wonder, you worry about those. Like, what are those things, which kind of started us down this conversation path originally, which was, how do we help support some of the small businesses that are out there? And, you know, if, if we've got friends that run and, and own small businesses and they're, de- they're they're just dramatically affected by this COVID-19 situation. Right. And it's kind of weird because I don't think I realized until this interview how much big businesses and all of us are impacted by the small business suffering. Yeah. The number of people in the Dallas economy that are employed by small business, it's that was eye opening to me. And then you go, this is really, I think we knew this was significant and that we need to do our part to try to bring people together around this. But uh, yeah, it was a little surprising at the amount of folks. But selfishly, I want those businesses to be around because I want to go to Dell's Charcoal Burgers in downtown Richardson, one of my favorite lunch spots. I need those guys around. So, But that's just one of many businesses. How do we go help support them? Right. And I think that Kelvin today did a fantastic job of being able to walk us through both what we can do to help small businesses and the resources that are available to small businesses so they can help themselves. Yeah. Kelvin is the CEO of the Dallas Citizens Council. What that basically is, is a group of the who's who of the CEOs of Dallas that gather together to help advocate for business. And Kelvin is in charge of that group of folks. And he was also tasked, uh, or that group was tasked by Mayor, Mayor Eric Johnson uh, with Dallas Forward. He talks about Dallas Forward in the, in the episode uh, to, to really provide resources for small businesses all through the Metroplex. And so we got connected with him. You got connected with him. And we were able to sit down and have a conversation and uh, learn a little bit about what they're doing. Learn a little bit about how bad is this situation? How much concern should we have? And then hear about what resources are available and what can we do, you and I, to help support those businesses that we want to prop up and make sure they're around. Right. He shed light on on this problem in a way that I never would have dreamed. It was I didn't realize it was this big of an issue. Yeah, I think we all kind of stuck our head in the sand initially, like, sure, this will go away. Now we're like, all right, we, we have to do something. What can we do? Right. It's one thing each business owner is sitting there going, I have to do something. But I'm sitting here going as a consumer, how can I help? What can I do? Right. Folks, enjoy the episode. Lots of good content in here. Share this with your friends and family who are are small business owners. Make sure they're aware of these resources. Kelvin, tell us a little bit about your career path. How did you get to where did how did you get to Dallas? To, to, sure. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, to get to Dallas, well, started my career in Atlanta with what has now become Bank of America of all things. I used to actually travel to this very building we're in today uh, when it was called Nations Bank and NCMB. But I moved here in 99 to join John Ware, who was leaving the city of Dallas to partner with Tom Hicks to start a firm called 21st Century, part of the another private equity fund under the umbrella of Hicks Muse taking first. And so I uh, got the opportunity after having been in banking and investment banking to join John in January 2nd of 1999 and I moved here. Okay. Uh, so been here ever since. So you've been a Dallas guy for quite a while. Yeah, now yeah. 21 years. I would have... You could not have told me I would be here more than three or four years. And where are you originally from? Uh, originally from Griffin, Georgia, okay. just about you know thirty miles south of Atlanta. Yeah. How do you? How, what's is there a cultural difference between the two? Uh, Atlanta and Dallas. Mm-hmm. Oh, big big cultural difference. How so? I think. I think uh, Dallas is a very. Uh, well, put it this way, Dallas and Atlanta look 
a lot uh, alike. Okay. Uh, new buildings, the new south, beautiful highways, infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. All the things that will make you think they're alike. I think the cultures are very different. Okay. Uh, just because everything from the form of government is different. You know, there the mayor is the, the, the chief executive here. The, the city manager is the chief executive mm-hmm. of the city. So the business interaction is a little bit different culturally. I think um, there is a, a different uh, ethnic mix there. I mean, in terms of the larger African-American population, they've had uh, over the years more African-American mayors, and there has been more of a synthesis and, and um, a culture of working together mm. to build entrepreneurship entrepreneurship across the entire city. Okay. Not that that hasn't happened here, but those are the business things I see are different. Right. I think Dallas on the other side is a very much so, uh, pe- you can just show up here and grow a business. You can show up here mm-hmm. and get an opportunity. Yeah. I, I felt like when I moved here, if I hadn't liked what I was doing uh, with 21st Century when I moved, I saw 10 other things I could do almost immediately. And an attitude toward, you know, everybody from, this was the days of the dot-com boom, Seems like the waiter had a deal. Everybody had a deal. <laughs> yeah. Very much a, the business can sure. do mindset. Which right. I, which everybody I like. had a strategy or a game plan or something. Oh working. yeah, they've got everybody had a business plan for you. Ninety nine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which how does that affect what you guys do here in terms of that culture? Sure. Well, you know, with the Citizens Council, you know, I spent all my career in the private sector, but got to know through nonprofit and uh, philanthropic efforts and civic efforts a lot of the board members, and ultimately got the opportunity to become the CEO of the Citizens Council. Well, I think the attitude permeates how we think about even this pandemic and everything. What can we do, you know, as the CEOs of large companies, Mm -hmm. what can you do to help make Dallas better? And uh, so that's been the history of the city for the last, history of the organization for the last 83 years. And, you know, more recently, very focused on how we create more inclusive growth, which includes small business, which includes you know, those who are in southern Dallas and other places where the, the prosperity hasn't been shared as, as as dramatically as we've seen in the north side of town. I see. And so your your task is really to advocate for Dallas business. Absolutely. Right. We we are a business advocate, a voice for for, for business, uh, along with many other voices in, in the city. Now ours has been more laser focused at the CEO level given okay. the who our member <clears throat> who our members are. All right. With the idea of you know what are the the silos or the areas or that pillars that we need to to focus on from workforce, edu- you know workforce and education, healthcare, transportation, as a means of saying how can business be an advocate to help Dallas be better. Right, and how has that changed over the past year with what's going on? Well, you know, um, we started out in January with a with a great plan to focus on particularly workforce and how we create more connectivity between the business community. Uh, Dallas Community College, well now Dallas College and DISD and Richardson ISD. How do you, how do we make sure the people, the young people coming through the system, we're delivering a great product, great, ed- well-educated workforce that can stay here, grow and thrive. And that was our idea. That plus, how do you then also uh, make uh, housing more attainable and affordable, single family homes, multifamily, everything, so that people want to live in the city. Sure. That was our idea in January and February, and then along came yeah. uh, the pandemic. Right. And it just throw all the, throw the playbook away. Right. Yeah. And uh, from there, it was, you know, for the, I think for the first week, I think everybody was in shock a little bit after sure. the, you know, the, the first uh, shutdown. Mm. But then we said, who's being affected? Mm. And how do how does the largest of large companies, who many of whom are going to be fine because they've got great liquidity, access to capital, infrastructure, many of them are selling essential services, how do you make the rest of Dallas uh, stay on equal footing or right. survivable footing? At what point did you realize okay this is going to be have an impact? I know originally when I sure. when I started hearing the news, mm-hmm. I was actually in the middle of talking to somebody on a podcast mm-hmm. and and thinking yeah this is. This is going to blow over quick. We'll be back yeah. to work. And then there was a time you're like, oh, man, this is going to have an economic effect. Yeah. It, it was two or three things. First, it was um, getting a call from uh, Judge Clay Jenkins. And he said, hey, I think we've got some community spread here. There are a few people who have been affected in Balt Springs and a couple of other places. And I thought, sounds serious. And he started talking about what do you think the impact is? And then it appeared. We could tell it was going to affect travel right away. Right. But I thought, this is a week or two thing. We'll figure it out. Then the next day, um, I come in the office, and we get an email that says, 
someone in the building had tested positive. Oh, yeah. And then the next day, and, and that was the day I said, guys, let's, it's real. we're going to work from home. <laughs> yeah. And I think the next day was the day Rudy Gobert uh, from the NBA tested positive. Yeah. I said, this is far reaching, yeah. and we may be home for a while. But I right. thought home for a while meant a month. Yeah, exactly. I did yeah. too. I thought I it meant too. a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think initially I did as well. And then you realize this is not going away. No. And then when you see <clears throat> that kind of impact, um, you know, as a stockholder and as, a, as, a, as an investor mm-hmm. myself, mm-hmm. I go, this is not good. Yeah. Uh, this is definitely going to have an impact. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then we kind of <clears throat> personally, my wife and I start to realize, okay, some of the small businesses that we love. Yes. Uh, you know, our local butcher shop, uh, mm-hmm. the local bar you like to go to, mm-hmm. those type of places you go, these guys are going to suffer. This yes. is, And then you're, we're trying to figure out how can we help? What can right. we do to support? So has that been similar for you guys? You've had to pivot a little bit yourselves to yes. say, how do, what, do we, what can we do? We have focused uh, 100% of our efforts now on how can large businesses help small business? Right. Um, when you think of Dallas, broadly defined, 53% of all People work in companies that are small to mid-sized businesses. Yeah, it's forty percent of the of the economic output. Yeah. Um, we don't bring them back. They're not enough Toyotas, AT and T's, TIs, Bank of Americas to to stitch this economy in Dallas or anywhere right. back together. Right. So we say, well, how can we create interventions to help them? Yeah. And at the end of the day, the first intervention everybody needed was money, right? Because you you don't need you know, millions of people on the unemployment rolls. So, um, you know, no one knew exactly how to figure this out. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of you kind of traveling through my mind in, in April now. Yeah. And then we hear the federal response with PPP loans. Right. And our first thing there was to say, how do we push this information out to everybody? Okay. Uh, but then we began to think through, what else can you do? Yeah. And you know, hats off to the city for creating a, at first I think a five million dollar fund, and then some of the surrounding counties doing it. Then Dallas County do, did $5 million, and then I've added another $30 million to it. Wow. And then um, the D- Dallas Entrepreneur Center uh, is raising a revive fund, and they've raised about $3 million, hopefully to get to at least $5 million, to give out $25,000 grants and coaching yeah. uh, for small businesses. Yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to get into with you. Is I noticed on the Dallas Forward page, and maybe we can yeah. describe a little bit of what sure. Dallas Forward is, sure. uh, but I saw there was coaching available. Maybe we'll sure. talk a little bit about that. But maybe first, before I get into that, maybe describe what Dallas Forward is. Sure. So um, in probably April, um, the the mayor set up an economic recovery task force led by Richard Fisher, former CEO, president and CEO of the Dallas Federal Reserve. And he ultimately asked Fred Propal, the uh, CEO of Beck, uh, Beck Construction, to join him uh, to, to be the co-chair. And Fred happens to also be the board chair for the Dallas Citizens Council. So uh, I began to work a little bit with them to think through, you know, what do you think are the interventions we need? And I think Richard and Fred were both convinced pretty early on that we got to save small business. And the mayor was very convinced of that. And in fact, so were the county leaders as well. And uh, so we began to work hard at what can we do just beyond money? Yeah. What all do they need? So it's technical assistance, coaching. It's getting them information about loan and grant programs. It's how do we get them inexpensive ac- access to inexpensive PPE? Mm-hmm. How do we get them some free PPE, which uh, we'll talk about in a second that we had a, a giveaway just recently, a- and put house it all in one place. So we created a website and then really kind of a – organization, I guess you can call, dallasforward.org. So if you go to that website, we have pretty much, I think, every intervention and idea that small businesses need for what to do now that it's time to reopen. Everything from reopening protocols by by industry to tell you what to do so that people know that you're safe uh, for them to come in. How do your employees know that that they're safe? How do you make sure you maintain safety in the workplace? Uh, and also be open, frankly, right? Yeah. So so the website would start, we kicked it off maybe two or three weeks ago with a big press conference. And uh, we've had a lot of traffic on the site, uh, a lot of great partners from uh, Dallas Entrepreneur Center to um, Dallas College, who, who they're helping us with some of the back-end management because they actually have a very large small business development center and a very large um, team that focuses purely on helping small businesses with coaching and mentoring. 
Kevin, any recent activity your office has been involved with to try to help out? Sure. So um, through uh, Dallas Forward, we just had a PPE giveaway the last two days where we, for probably over 350 businesses registered uh, to receive anywhere from 300 to 600 uh, masks, gloves, hand sanitizer. Um, we had a ton of response for that because we really wanted to find ways to to lower the reopening costs for a lot of our small businesses. So we've already gotten emails back from some saying this is a lifeline to us so that, you know, you think about a small business buying, you know, 10 to 50 masks at a time, they're paying 4 or $5 a mask as opposed to if you can buy it in bulk, they can have a much lower price. And so we were able to get donations from a lot of different organizations around the, uh, the city, uh, large and small companies. We had over 300,000 masks that we gave away. Wow. And so uh, we were very gratified by the response. And uh, over a two-day period, we've helped at least 350 businesses, probably more, because some were buying them. I mean, uh, we were giving them away. Some were getting them to maybe give away to some other smaller businesses sure. that they knew. So Awesome. Very That's excited fantastic. about it. So the coaching piece. <clears throat> I, mm-hmm. I saw that available on the site. You got mm-hmm. it would, that. That's the one that caught my attention because sure. you're going to have a lot of folks that they're just, they're just not sure what to do, mm-hmm. right? And they're not sure even if they can get to the website. Oh, we'll talk about that in a second, because right. that's like that's a separate challenge. That's true. Of what do we do? It's true. But for folks that do have the technology and they're getting out there, what does that what does that coaching look like? So you go to the website and you can say, I, "I'd like a coach." It literally has a, a button for you to click. I, I need coaching. So you fill out a form and you get paired with someone based on your needs. If you say, I'm really trying to grow my business, I really need to focus on customer retention, whatever your issues are, and they pair you with a coach who has, who is currently an entrepreneur, a former entrepreneur, or, or, or current or former, former executive that can focus on that. Yeah. One-on-one coaching, of course, most of it's virtual now, sure. um, to help you with that technical part of your business. It may be, which so many businesses needed during the PPP loan sort of 1.0 and 2.0 process, coaching around um, formation. I'll give you an example. So a lot of companies in Dallas would say, oh, I, I got 12 employees. And you'd say, okay, great. But then when you when people dug into it to get ready to, to help them with their PPP loan, they really had one employee themselves, mm-hmm. and they had 11 individual 1099 contractors. They weren't paying their benefits. Right. Uh, they were just independent contractors. So they couldn't count that money in the beginning as part of their payroll and expenses. So many companies had to reorganize, either figure out ways to make all these folks uh, employees yeah. with benefits right. so that they could then get yeah. the, uh, the the loans and grants. Sure. So a lot of that, the tech, this has created a moment in time where many companies have said, wow, you know, I, had, I never thought about it, but I have to now shift and be properly organized so that I can receive the capital that can keep me uh, afloat. Yeah, I can totally relate because I think just when setting up the podcast, setting up an LLC, <clears throat> yeah. going th- you go through this process, you educate yourself, mm-hmm. right? My degree is electrical engineering, mm-hmm. not business, none of these things, right? As if I don't know. They, engineers can do anything. Yeah, they right. can. We'll yeah. figure it out, right. right? I can I can read and, right. Uh, right. and and I'm uh, ambitious enough. We'll figure it out. But you still, you go through that. And I still, I was on a call yesterday with somebody asking me, LLC or S Corp. And mm-hmm. I, I don't remember. It was like a year ago when I went through right, this. Right. So even if you, no matter how witty you are, how smart you are at these things, it's still things that people forget, especially mm-hmm. if their companies have been around for a while. Mm-hmm. Having a coach like that to go through some of those things, because the last thing you want is a T not crossed, mm-hmm. causing an impact to your to your, to your your business, right? So, Absolutely. Yeah. I think that was one of the things that was crushing a lot of small businesses nationwide. It's a very specific protocol with the SBA program. God yeah. bless them. Uh, yeah. And so you had to go, if you missed one thing, uh, you left one thing blank or you, it, it would just kick out your application. Yeah. So a very tedious process, but it was a big learning for a lot of small and mid-sized businesses yeah. on what to do. And I think it's made, made a lot of businesses say, now let me make sure I'm focused on this all the time yeah. for the betterment of my business long term. Sure. I think the part we're hoping with coaching is that, okay, we can help you through this crisis, but how are you thinking about your business in 2023? And what are you thinking today about that? Yeah. So that we create more businesses that have infrastructure, succession planning, leadership that allows them to, you know, when things are good again, because when things are going well, nobody thinks about all this stuff. But sure. you want to get the coaching through that. Now, are those coaching, is that coaching also including some of the pivoting strategies and thoughts? Or is it just, is that? It, 
Some, yes. right? I, I think we saw several companies in the in light of the first round of the, the pandemic in kind of late March, early April, who said, you know what? Um, if for no other reason, because I want to help out, I'm going to shift the line of my business to now make masks or, or make face shields. Because, you know, the county and the city, everybody was dying. Hospitals were dying for more PPE. Yeah. And you couldn't source it anywhere globally. So you had several companies uh, who just said, you know what, I'm going to just change one of my operating lines for now and make 10,000 face shields. Yeah. Uh, some who gave them away, I think some are now beginning to think, well, hey, this isn't, everyone thought this was a moment in time. We're going to need face shields and masks for a long, long time. So yeah. I think now some companies are starting to say, well, maybe I make this a permanent part of my business, yep. figure out the right margins to sell it, and uh, and supply locally or, or globally. And that's the reason I ask, because when you mentioned 2023, that's yeah. where my mind goes, is mm-hmm. it's one thing to pivot, but we don't know how long this is going to go, and if it, it, may, it may have a, um, a permanent I- impact in some way. So, yes. Uh, a lot of small businesses need to think not only about what they're pivoting to right now, but mm-hmm. is is that something that's going to scale in the future? Is something that's going to be a great example <clears throat> is we were talking earlier about uh, Fletcher's Corny Dogs, where they're looking at yeah. pivoting. The state fair is canceled now; mm-hmm. they've got to pivot over in another direction, so they've had the ability to go uh, have pop up stands. But that mm-hmm. will be good for them for a long term, you know, period of time. So I think it's mm-hmm. really good that you guys have people available that are at least able to think through and help out. And I could definitely see just the, the sheer amount of paperwork alone is yeah. intimidating it, it, it's crushing right and because and, i think most of these companies they're good at what they've been doing yeah. whatever their brand they've built in their community right. they want to keep doing that many of them are trying to reshape it you've got people saying well you know what i got a food truck i got to move it around now i have a restaurant now i've got a, i know of a caterer in town who said you know what i'm just going to have some pop-ups yep and i'm gonna or i'm gonna say hey on father's day he Here's the menu, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have a thousand meals on Mother's Day, right. um, because this as this persists, people still have to eat, right? So you right. say, well, how do I how, how do I change? And people want to get out of the house too. Right? They want to get out. <laughs> you know, we had a there's a restaurant that we went to up in Plano that um they're really a caterer, and what they did was they they were able to use the parking lot. This was would have probably been right around Mother's Day. They were able to use the parking lot and said, look, you can order your food. You kind of drive through this little thing. They give you the food. Then everyone was set up in the parking lot yeah. with their friends and families eating. So people are being creative. Yeah. I want to get uh, into the – well, maybe let's hit this point before we jump into the impact on Dallas because okay. I'd like to I'll sure. have a better idea what's how, how Dallas is impacted, and I think mm-hmm. you might have a better perspective on that. But, you know, you're talking about the support in Dallas Forward and, mm-hmm. and the website for people to go and get, get this uh, these resources that are available. But what about the folks who have no access to the Internet? What, mm-hmm. uh, it's hard to imagine, but but that, that exists, yeah. right? And right. part of the small business challenge is it's really mm-hmm. this tale of a distribution. It's so – there's just there's, sure. there's so many, right, in Dallas alone uh, that you're trying to support. And and there are, there are going to certainly be folks that have technolo- technology challenges as well. Sure. So it is interesting. You want to say, hey, we got this website. And you're like, well, great. I don't know how to get to it. Then you say, well, just go to the website to get the number. Well, they can't go to the website. Yeah. So – we we did set up uh, a call center as well, so we've got four there, and and we sent we did do some limited mailers, so someone can and they can get information through. We sent it out through some of the coalitions of churches, so they could, you know, send it out through their their announcements for people who listen in by phone, mm-hmm. so that they know how to get to it. And so we have an eight hundred number for DallasForward.org that then they can say, hey, get connect me to a coach, okay, uh, connect me to. Uh, PPE resources, awesome. and, and those people can walk them through. But okay. it is a challenge. I mean, yeah. another part of it is some people have some connectivity, but it's limited, particularly when you throw in, you know, they're working at home and throw put two kids on the Xbox and this and that. This, right. The bandwidth becomes a challenge oh, as yeah. well. I can, yeah, I can definitely relate <laughs> to that yeah. challenge. So let's talk a little bit about the impact on Dallas. How, okay. How, how do we, how should we feel about that? As as you know, you've been here since ninety nine. Sure. I've been in Texas mm-hmm. all my life. This mm-hmm. is home. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're very prideful, right? Uh, very. And so how, uh, about well, I would say uh, yeah, pride's the right right way to say it. Um, how bad are we looking at? How do you what, do? You, do you have a take on that? You know, it's hard to to quantify, but I'll say this: when you think about fifty three percent of everyone working for small small to mid sized businesses, forty percent of the, of the economic output. Um, you know, it, there are huge challenges as we see uh, the continued retail bankruptcies 
uh, and what that'll do to, to the supply chain. You know, a lot of companies going out, a lot of the mid-sized retailers going out of business Tuesday morning, which is headquartered here. Several other wow. retailers have filed bankruptcy, and some are, yeah. are beginning to liquidate stores. It tells you that you move one level down to those small suppliers who sell into them. Uh, it, it, it's going to be a challenge for some companies, for some organizations to come back because as large companies are able to work remotely, uh, you think about this area downtown, 72-story building that's mostly empty, yep. the impact on the restaurants and the that's cleaners. Right. Yeah. Uh, we've got a ways to go. Right. And I think the way we make them, these companies, uh, small businesses survive, survive won't just be with technical assistance. There probably has to be thought about another round of capital, that forgivable loans, so they can sustain themselves until the fall as we try to figure out what it, what it means once kids go back to school. So a combination of uh, supporting, propping up financially, and, and in yes. addition to coaching about how to pivot. Uh, yes. I, I do find that to be critical because I'm, I'm in the boat of thinking, like, the money can't just be there forever. Eventually, be, right. eventually that, that has to, mm-hmm. you know, it's not coming from fields of sunflowers. We still have to come up with a strategy mm-hmm. and help these businesses adjust and adapt because mm-hmm. we really don't know how long this is going to last or what the long-term impact is going to be, mm-hmm. right? When you think about uh, how we move around now, um, in January, you could be riding around with your family and just say on an impulse, we're going to stop here and eat. Yeah. And then we're going to go to these two stores and pick up a few things and go home. Yeah. Uh, now most of that is you're sitting at home and you order it online, you wait for it to come. Or, you know, you, you have things and say, you know what, I'm just going to order it on Amazon. I'm not even going to get up right. off my couch to go. T- I mean, I literally ordered, you know, razors and razor blades from Amazon. I got yeah. them the next day. It was like 9 or 10 bucks. Yeah. I would normally have gone to Walgreens and bought five other things or gone right. to the, the neighborhood store and bought yeah. five other things other than that. Right. And that, it's that incremental purchase that we're losing yeah. that um, I think is going to be a challenge because we're remote. So what does that mean for a small business? If you're in the consumer side, you've got to figure out a way to get in that online channel, either because you become an online seller yeah. through Amazon or you've got to figure out some other way to say – I'm going to be special to my customers in whatever radius that I trade. Right. And it's easy for me to say sitting here, but I right. think that's the thought process that has to occur. Yeah, the chain coming from from the folks making things to the folks who are consuming is, yeah. is, is adjusted. Yes. And you've got to find a way to get into that stream in you some way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess each, each industry is a little bit different. Like you mm-hmm. talked about restaurants and the food industry. They're having to adapt in ways to allow themselves to be more mobile, focus on safety, focus mm-hmm. on on all elements of that. And then we've got some folks that aren't impacted. And some, po- some folks will thrive. Yes, and, and some small well. businesses are, are thriving. When you yeah. look at construction remained an essential business. Sure. Uh, you, you look at the whole supply chain around home improvement. Um, because everyone's been home more, every married couple has spent more time with their spouse than they've ever spent before in their lives. Yeah. Uh, Which might be good or bad. <laughs> hopefully it's good. Hopefully, hopefully we're strengthening marriages. We, we we'll see. Right? Yeah, that's right. We'll see. Uh, or, or there are going to be a lot of lawyers we'll, we'll and a lot see. of work. <laughs> that's what uh, I was about to say. But uh, yeah. I think uh, you think about everyone saying, gosh, now I got to fix. I want to fix my fence. I'm tired of looking at my fence, mm. leaning a little bit. You, true, didn't, you didn't pay attention as much when you yeah. were going to work and coming home. That's right. Yeah, I want to do stuff in my yard. So there are a lot of people, the home improvement world, Seems to be fine. Building construction is probably doing better because people have time to improve right. uh, because no one's here in the buildings. Right. But um, there are a lot of kind of manufacturers who are probably struggling. Right. And they've got to think of what can I make now that's mm-hmm. needed today, that's yeah. essential. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get into Dallas specific. Okay. You know, uh, we, we see this quote from, from the mayor, from Eric Johnson. And I'll, I'll give the quote for listeners here. He said, uh, I believe Dallas is both the assets and the people to become a national leader in the economic recovery. Why? What does that look like? I would say we are, uh, we, we have a nice inter- sort of intersectionality of great business leaders, uh, great philanthropic leaders, uh, and great. Uh, sort of nonprofit institutions. I'll give you a few examples. Um, N- North Texas Cares, which is a, it's probably 130, 140 nonprofits that in a matter of a week or two, all these nonprofits and foundations had organized themselves, created a website to say, we're all together, send us whatever your issues are. And every nonprofit or, or philanthropic organization figured out ways, well, we'll fund that, we'll fund that, we'll address that. Uh, I mean, I'm telling you, quicker even than the, some ways in the private sector got organized around this. 
um, because they saw the need. And now you're seeing, you know, people like, um, you know, uh, Lida Hill, you know, great philanthropist here in town, uh, really looking to work on a lot of the healthcare issues, but they also intersect where the private sector is working and also where, you know, local government is working. We seem there seems to be a whole lot more uh, hand in glove working together of all of our companies, from the AT and T's and TIs of the world to the Dallas Foundation and Communities Foundation. And so I'm optimistic that the the fact that there's a lot of uh, interplay between those and communication that it, it'll bring us back faster. Yeah. And I mean faster. We we can't move any faster than the spread of the the virus, frankly. But I think I think that's allowing us to have uh, less of an impact in some places. Sure. Do you see any any cases of like one of the things I observe is I've got friends in California and New York, <clears> and they say uh, they'll tease us about Texans. You won't wear a mask, and you you wonder why you're going to keep being affected by this. Do you see any kind of uh, is there is there a culture that's there that's having any effect, or is it just yes. uh, yeah? You think so? Yeah. I think I think what threw most of America off when we were all fixated on watching New York, right? The yeah. High density, just the 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 trauma, the tragedy was happening at a rapid pace, right? Because we really hadn't identified how serious the virus was yet. Yeah. But you thought, well, I live in a planned community, all this space. I don't take a train to work with 500 people smushed against me, so I can't get the virus. Yeah. And so I think it probably lulled us to sleep right. a little bit. While the virus was spreading here, we never had the issue. Right. But I think our desire to live the way we want to live in Texas, where people want to get out, do stuff, and the, and the fact that the cases were low yeah. made people, uh, we, we sort of let our guard down. Right, and then had to put the clamps back yeah. on. Yeah, we're right. not New York. No, we're not New York, but yeah. – but the virus is here. But we're not we're not immune, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think a lot of us are starting to uh, at least have connection with a few people that that are impacted by it. And yes. then, like you said, there's somebody in your building, there's several folks yep. in our office, and mm-hmm. they immediately go, "All right, mm-hmm. this is not something to joke around it, about." It's, it's coming closer to home for yeah. for, for, for most everybody, right. and uh, it has business implications, of course, sure. because the more I spread here, is the slower we can get back to whatever we think the next normal is. But right. Right. So I'm a small business owner out there mm-hmm. and uh, I'm struggling. And right. what, what hope do I have? Like what, what, what commentary can you give uh, to the small business owner out there in Dallas that's struggling? I know it's a challenging time. I, I would say that the two things would be um, there are services available to you to help you through the, the coaching and technical assistance side. There are several capital programs, uh, city, county, Dallas Revive Fund, and a few national ones by everybody from PayPal, Lowe's. There's several of them uh, that can get help you help you solve or resolve some of the capital challenges. I think the best way to get the th- how to think through the, this crisis is to get some coaching. And there are two. In addition to us, there's another website called Dallas Builds. B U I L D S dot org that um, is connected to our website and it has a very extensive, extensive ecosystem of small business um, coaching as well as capital resources. Some investors and others who principally focus on North Texas and small businesses. And I think those two resources alone should be a bright spot. Um, you know, I think. None of us can predict the healthcare side of this, but I think there are real resources that can, that people can avail themselves of that are free, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, free coaching, uh, so it's an opportunity to to at least be able to find resources to survive. Absolutely. And what are what are the immediate steps? Like, if if you're out there and you're small business owner X, what are the immediate? They hopefully they've taken some of those steps already. But if they're right. just now starting to see the effect of this, uh, what are the immediate <clears throat> steps that you'd recommend that they take right now? If you're just seeing the the immediate initial effects because you're having challenges, I'd say get get a coach, get yeah. some get some advice. There's free advice to be had from experienced coaches who can help you think through how to manage through the crisis. Yeah, and then do a real step back on, you know, what is my financial reality? Uh, what capital that of a permanent level that's not necessarily a loan is available to me. 
And those would be my first, uh, the things I would advise someone to do, uh, which most people have probably already done. Uh, and then how do I think more creatively about um, operating or reopening? How do I reopen my business in a way that's going to still be have a compelling value proposition? Yeah. Okay. It's hard, though. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, it's impossible to say, but do you anticipate a prolonged impact on the city? And if so, what would that look like? <laughs> Well, the challenge is right that you can't you can't shutter your business for thirty, sixty, ninety days, and then just say, "Okay, we're going to crank it back up and get going." There is that inertia when you're at you know ground zero to start and back over. So I think it's going to take a while. I mean, we can't re- we won't recover overnight. I think we you know, the course of the next year as we begin to get people back out into the out into society as we push these uh, the, the numbers down for the virus, I think that that gives people comfort to take a little more risk. It gives, you know, cap, private capital markets more, you know, the banks, the lending institutions, uh, more comfort to take more risk. Um, and I think they will in this environment uh, within, you know, within reason uh, as they see the economy improve. It's kind of small business. There's an interdependency between the small businesses and all the capital providers out there to kind of watch what's going on. Sure. Um, but I think, you know, I, I'm hoping 2021 is better. I think 2020, we just got to, we, we're just in the face where we got to fight through all of this. Right. And 2021 is one where we got to look and say, again, what interventions by everybody, private sector, philanthropy, nonprofit, uh, our local and state government and federal, to keep what is the largest part of our employee base in a position to, I'm just going to say survive. Thrive will come later in 2021, but survive. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. What can consumers do? So we talked a little bit at the beginning about for those of us that love Dallas and love like the – Sure. Um, I had somebody um, uh, <clears throat> last week, an employee, ask me uh, recommendations. They're new to Dallas recently, mm-hmm. relocated to Dallas. And what are some things to do in Dallas? And I was listing restaurants. <laughs> that was the yeah. first thing that went to my mind is we've got some great restaurants, but we've got great small businesses that we love. Mm-hmm. There's an arcade I like to take my family and, mm-hmm. you know, things that are not really franchise chains, but they're just yeah. really great. But that, that's what I believe. we, we got to support small business by showing up. Um, you know, we, our salons, if you haven't been to the barber, I haven't been, I haven't been in a long time. You, you need to pay them a little bit more when you go. Yeah. Because uh, they're trying to manage – this big gap of uh, revenue loss and support. Our, you know, I'm taking my clothes a little more often to the cleaners, even though I'm I'm wearing a whole lot more t-shirt and shorts shorts than I normally would have, right. just so I can keep supporting sure. supporting those small businesses as best I can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nothing against the the franchise owner of the McDonald's. I, I I support them too. Right. But a lot of our small the mom and pops who put every dime of their money into a new business. Yeah, you know, to 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 serve a community, we we gotta we gotta stop by and support them, and then we can even amplify it. Say, hey, I went here. Why don't you guys meet me here? Yeah. Or let's all do takeout from here. Right. Um, and I and we focus so much on restaurants, but partly because that's such a huge part, you know, of how you know the things flow downhill. That's right. Yeah, and I think that's a part of what we try to do on the podcast is share the story of some of those businesses yeah. to highlight them for mm-hmm. people to go. So that then that would probably be my last question for you. Do you have any any success stories that you've seen? There's plenty of bad ones, right? But do you have any success yeah. stories that you could speak to of uh, some of the small businesses that have been able to pivot or make changes? Well, I've seen a few uh, you know, a few catering businesses that have, that have done very well with this. I've seen some restaurants who are doing a whole lot better with takeout cuz a lot of them have never done takeout, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think it's been the combination of uh, independent contractors like the Uber and Lyft drivers saying, hey, why don't you let me do this for you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll tell you one one that's not even that big, that's a big business, but you know, I think they may be franchised. Chuck E. Cheese did a very interesting thing of all places. You know, shut down, you can't have the kids running around in there. And so they started selling, I think, wings and pizza on yeah. takeout. Yeah. And they were like five bucks or something like that. Yeah. And I know in several neighborhoods, the lines were out the door mm. um, as a way to keep the customer connection until they could reopen. Sure. Um, you know, I've seen some small businesses in my neighborhood offer discounts, uh, you know, some in North Dallas and some other places. Or the cleaners offering discounts if you bring more of your things that you don't like, your rugs and the other stuff that you don't 
think about sure. uh, as a way to kind of keep that connectivity. Right, right. Looking for clever ways to go capture. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that, I think the first uh, pick a time frame, 45 days, everybody was in shock. Yeah. Right? You just could not – you thought, well, this will be over next week, so I'll get back to normal. Oh, this will be over until you said, wait a minute. I fundamentally won't ever be able to operate like I operated before. Yeah, put my head in the sand, this will all go away. Yeah. That was yeah. kind of uh, at least my initial reaction, and then you realize this is not going away. No. And then we got to figure out what we can do, right? Yeah. So maybe that would be my last my question for you is, you know, if you if hindsight's always <clears throat> 2020. Mm-hmm. If you go back, you know, to to March, uh, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe February time frame, would there be anything you'd do differently to prepare to get you for your office to prepare to uh, – for what we're dealing with right now? Um, you know, but think about that. In February, the the coronavirus seemed to be away in some distant land. Yeah. You know, and and, I, uh, and we thought, wow, this there may be some cases, but yeah. how will this really affect us? And we had a board meeting, I think, on March the 4th, where our uh, the CEO of Children's Hospital was on our board, Chris Durbich, um, gave some remarks on, look, guys, make sure you wash your hands, wear a mask, you know, do all the things to keep yourself safe because the virus is very contagious. And we thought, sage advice. But I think the rapid spread just threw us all off. Yeah. If, we, if we look back on it, I think we would have, I don't know that we would have closed our offices any sooner. I think we would have been monitoring, well, how are we going to plan the rest of the year and what do virtual events look like for us? Yeah. yeah. We probably would have started thinking about that earlier. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we probably would have, I'll say one last thing, we would probably start advocating more publicly yeah. to keep Dallas safe. You know, we we have we, we um, released a, a PSA yesterday done by Emmett Smith uh, about, it was called Dallas Comeback. It's really about, he's showing him washing his hands and wearing a mask, but saying, let's, if we all do it together, it's up to all of us. And we've done a couple of others. We probably would have been out a little more publicly as a voice of business saying, let's all do this together so we can all come back uh, more quickly. Right. Yeah. Anything else, any other resources you want to let uh, small business owners across the Metroplex know about? Sure. Well, so, of course, DallasForward.org uh, and then DallasBuilds.org, both places for great uh, resources for for small businesses. Um, so I'd encourage all small businesses to go there if you need a coach to register. Um, so I think those are two the two best. I think I would also encourage all of them to look at resources through their banks for webinars. They're all starting to do them. We're going to hopefully populate some of those on the Dallas Forward site so that we can continue to provide information. And lastly, I'd say if they have not applied for the county, Dallas County um, Relief Fund for the Revive Fund or the City of Dallas Funds, which I think they may still be accepting applications. And if they live in Collin, Collin County has a similar one, and so does Denton, that um, they should do that. Okay. Avail yourself of every opportunity for capital. Yeah. Kelvin, thank you for the time. I think uh, we have a mutual passion that small business in Dallas, just, we have to have, this has to be successful. Got to make a comeback, even yes. The, even the big companies where I work, we're going to be affected by these guys not being successful, so we got to make that comeback. So I uh, appreciate what your office does to, to help out. Well, thank you. This was a great episode of how to help the small businesses there in Dallas and how they are suffering. But in reality, there are small businesses all over the Metroflex. We live a little bit further out towards East Texas in a little town called Roy City. It is on the other side of Rockwall. And in Roy City, we have a place called Butcherman's Gourmet Sausage. And these guys are legit. And it's one thing to pick up meat, you know, at the local franchise. There's nothing wrong with the franchise grocery stores. Like, I, we'll go to Costco and stock up. That's a, that's a good deal. But for some products, I definitely want to focus in on local. And these guys are one of the best. These are my favorites. If I'm going to pick up some ribeyes or some brisket or whatever they have. And the great thing about it is you'll get a notification. You, I'll follow them on Facebook, and I'll see they got tomahawk ribeyes. 
I'm out the they door. They just <laughs> pulled some smoked chickens off the smoker. Yes, so it's fantastic. That's a way to go. Now, to be clear, these guys are not sponsoring us anyway. We just love them. We want to make sure that they are still there yeah. a year from now. So we want to take them our business. So that's something that we've done. You guys in the same right in your area, you can do the same thing. Find those places that you uh, really know and love that you want to be there. And if you know of great local businesses that 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 have great success stories that are pivoting and going through this challenge as well, uh, feel free to let us know. Reach out to us. We'd like to hear their story as well. We may feature them on the episode. Yeah, and we're on all the social medias. You can reach out to us through our website, email. Have a great week, folks. 